President, please be seated. The court is back in session. Before I give the floor to the defense team for Mr. Nguyen Xie, I would like to give a response to the defense team for Mr. Kim Song Pong. The chamber granted the request by uh, defense counsel for Mr. Kim Song Pong to delay time for the response to E. 370 until the chamber is uh, notified uh, the decision on the matter. The chamber would like to inform uh, parties that responses to document E370 parties are required to make oral submission in due course. No written submission are required by the chamber. The chamber would like to inform that it will try its best to make the decision on the request in relation to document E363 in due course to deal with the challenges before all of us so that we can proceed uh, hearing civil party and witnesses as scheduled this week and the following week. Now I hand over the floor to the defense team for Mr. Nguyen Jie to resume his questioning to this civil party. You may now proceed. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, good morning again, Mr. Witness. Um, I'm trying to understand where exactly you were when you testified uh, that you had been hiding for three months and 29 days in the pond uh, close to the pagoda. Let me first ask you, do you know whether that pond is still there today? Answer. Yes, it remained. It was. It is still there. However, there were. N there, n there are not so many uh, water hyacinths uh, now today. In the past, there were many of uh, water hyacinths. Um. Now before the break, I was speaking to you um, about a road immediately adjacent to uh, the compound of the pagoda on the east side. Do you recall whether there is a small road immediately on the east side of the pagoda? Answer regarding the small road on the east side of the pagoda, yes, there was a small road. There were uh, many small roads uh, close to where I was uh, hiding myself. It was uh, about a hundred meter away from the pits. Yes, there were secondary or small roads uh, to the east of uh, the pagoda. I was hiding close to small roads, uh, very tiny roads uh, to the east of the pagoda. And this particular road that I just spoke about east of the pagoda, is that road going to the north and then around uh, the pond and backwards to the south to the river. Is that correct? Uh, 
Answer. That turning road was located to the east of the pagoda. That road reached the pit where I was hiding myself. So that tiny road was located uh, to the east of a main road near the pagoda. And once again, uh, that uh, tiny road uh, reached uh, the pit where I was hiding. I cannot tell you uh, the distance of uh, that tiny road. And I already told you the estimated distance uh, from the pit where I was hiding uh, to the pond and also to the pagoda. Um, right now there is a pond uh, on the east side of the pagoda, about one kilometer north of uh, the river, 500 meters a kilometer maybe away also from the pagoda, I'm not quite sure. But does the road go around the pagoda and back to the south. President, uh, please wait. Uh, Mr. Civil Party, you may now proceed. International Deputy Co Prosecutor. Jusqu'ici, je ne me suis pas levé, mais là, uh, je crois que le. I didn't rise earlier, but I think the lawyer has talked about the geography of that location. We will refer to a document on record, uh, probably photographs taken by the investigators of the OCIJ. That would be something objective, because we are talking in the air without any objective elements that we can rely on to describe that geographical location. Um, Mr. President, the only thing that I'm trying to do is to understand um, where he said he was hiding for three months and 29 days. It is correct that um, 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 the use of the documents on the case file um, are not now being used by me. Um, I was there a few days ago to just see how things are um, situated, that's very helpful, everyone wants you to do that. Um, but I'm trying to understand, because there's a road moving northwards right on the east side, and it goes around the pond, and just trying to understand from the witness whether um, the pond that I think is there is the one that he refers to. Bahai. President, the observation of the International Deputy Co-Prosecutor is appropriate. This, in, this matter raised uh, once again so when we discuss uh, security center of Grang Tajan. Mr. Kope, please rephrase your question. So please avoid testifying yourself try to avoid the objective, the subjective uh, comments that provided through witnesses and then elicit the answer from the civil party or witness. Mr. Civil Party, you are instructed not to respond to the last question put by different teams for Mr. Nguyen Chia. Let me reformulate the question, Mr. President. Um, do you know today if there is a road leading from the east side of the pagoda northwards to uh, the pond. Is there a road that goes around the pond today? Do you know? Answer. Now today, 
there is a new road and that a new road uh, reaches uh, the place where I was hiding. Uh, we uh, can uh, go from every direction to reach uh, the pit where I was hiding. It, goes to the, it is to the east of the pagoda. I can tell you there are many newly built roads, so uh, you will not get lost by using uh, those newly constructed roads. And during the period, there were tiny roads in the field, and I was trying to flee by using uh, different tiny roads. The place where I was hiding uh, was the place called Rabah. How far were you from the big road um, going southward, go, uh, from south to north, road uh, number 70, 70? Answer. You want to know the number of the newly constructed roads? That is uh, road 70. I cannot tell you the, the distance. But um, perhaps I can give you the estimates. Uh, but it is very difficult for me to give uh, my response. Uh, I'm not sure if we are getting somewhere, um, Mr. Witness. I will move on to another uh, subject. You said at one point uh, in your testimony that um, you wanted to resist um, what happened. You, you wanted to resist after you had been hiding, and that you said um, you said that you went to a mosque to try to find a weapon, uh, a gun. Um, why would you go to a mosque at the time to find a gun or a weapon? What made you think at the time that in the mosque there could be weapons? Answer. I was hiding in uh, that place and I I was hopeless. I heard the screaming, Oh Allah. And at that time I wanted to find any weapons I could have to help myself. So I uh, went around to different places to find uh, any weapons so that I could help uh, young people who had been, who were going to be killed at the pits. I went into a mosque to search for a weapon, but there was none. And I was hopeless finding no weapon. If I had found any weapons, I uh, would have uh, used them to help uh, my people, my jam people, my relatives, my villagers. So uh, this, is, this was the uh, purpose that I was going to search for any weapons. I was not hiding uh, the weapons. I hoped at the time to find a weapon so that I could help my people, Jam people, who were uh, mistreated. Um, but you also testified that mosques weren't used anymore. Um, you said that rice was stored in the mosque. 
What made you think at the time that, notwithstanding that, you could find a weapon in the mosque? Why go to the mosque to find a weapon? Ma, young men. Answer. There were guards at the mosque because the mosque were not allowed to use as a worship place. And uh, the grinders uh, were put in the mosque. There were guards. Because there were guards, I was thinking to myself that perhaps uh, there were weapons uh, armed by those guards. So I decided to go to the mosque to search for weapons. I uh, saw guards uh, lying in the mosque. I touched uh, their, his head. And uh, that person uh, was not aware that I was touching his head. And in the mosque, I uh, found no weapons. If there have been one or there have been weapons, I would have uh, taken them to help my people, Jam people. And where was this mosque that you just described? Which village? Answer. This mosque was located in the Seoul village. It was in uh, the Seoul, close to BMG Gong. It was adjacent. It was in the location adjacent uh, to uh, BMG Gong. Once again, uh, that mosque was located in. So village. In your um, testimony two weeks ago, Mr. Witness, you said, um, when you were describing what happened at the pond, um, this is um, Mr. President um, at two, 1451 seconds, um, 17 September, you said, Mr. Witness, somehow the people living nearby begged the Khmer Rouge to spare my life since I was not involved in any accused activities. Um, end of citation. What do you mean with you not being involved in accused activities? Answer. I lived, I was allowed to live there because I had uh, skills or education in that matter. I was expert in the diving to the bottom of the river, and the fishing group uh, needed the person who was specialized in diving. For this reason, uh, villagers uh, loved me, and uh, I could uh, survive since I uh, was specialized in diving. Uh, I was needed by them. Um, Mr. Witness, last week, Two weeks ago, you, um, when asked a question, uh, voluntarily offered to say, quote, I am not a novelist. I am not here to create a story. Um, what did you mean when you said that? Answer. 
answer. I was. I am not a novelist. Uh, it is my experience. I have went through. I witnessed the incidents, uh, and I am here to testify. I may have uh, forget uh, some information because I am quite old at this time. You can see that I have uh, no many teas. It is not a creation or is not a novel created by me. It is the experience I went through. Um, are the, the villagers today accusing you of being a novelist or somebody who creates stories, or is that not the case? Now today, a villagers uh, they they did not they do not uh, uh, say I am uh, the uh, creators of the story. They do not say I am the novelist. You can go and ask them. It is the experience I came across. I am he man and uh, went through that experience at that time. Um, very well. My last question, um, Mr. Witness. Um, something that you said um, while you were testifying here in court. Um, you were asked a question by the prosecution, um, Mr. President, that is, um, at around 1449, uh, 17 September. You were asked uh, a question by the prosecution about uh, the evacuation of Cham at 3 p.m. Um, villagers from Ankoban, Sakso, Antangsor. Um, and you answered as follows. All of them died because everyone was sent to work in the dam site, in the work site. So all of these people may have died because of labor. Why was it that you gave that answer to the question about the arrest of the Cham? Were you implying that they were arrested and subsequently were sent to work at the dam site or the work site? Answer. Let me respond. Some charm people were sent to that work site. They never returned afterwards. Some villagers were sent to work in a work site along National Road Number Six. They never came back after they were sent. They never returned. And only the source uh, returned. Villagers uh, within the village uh, were sent to the work site. 50% uh, of the villagers were sent to that work site. And among that 50% uh, uh, sent to the work site, only a uh, few came back, uh, that is, source. Once again, uh, 50 percent or some of uh, the villagers uh, were sent to uh, the work site, uh, that is, number six of work site. So is my understanding then correct that when Cham villages were um, rounded up on the day of the parade, that they were sent to work sites and uh, work sites at Road 6 and, and the dam site? Is, is that what you're saying?
President, uh, please hold on, Mr. Mann. You may now proceed, International Deputy Co-Prosecutor. Thank you. I believe that the question is not at all clear with regard to the period when this happens, and there might be also confusion uh, 10 days ago on the part of the witness, but it would be useful here to clarify when, because here we're speaking apparently about two different things. Being sent uh, to the worksite on road number six, which is very clearly different from what he said about what Otrakun. So I think uh, we should make a clear distinction between the events and the periods uh, that we are speaking about so that we will not lead the witness to contradict himself uh, Uh, I don't really see um, the contradiction. The, the answer given by the witness was in relation to that question, and then he specifically answered all of them died because everyone was sent to work in the dam site, in the work site. Um, and I think he just confirmed that. Um, uh, I can ask him about the period of time, but that, with this particular witness, that is kind of difficult, it seems. So. Um, I think the objection should not be um, uh, granted. President. The objection by the Deputy International Co Prosecutor is sustained, and the Defense Council should uh, make it clear regarding the effects you refer to in your questioning. He testified about Jan being sent to uh, Otokun. And the fact uh, in your question uh, seems to be of a different timeline. That is, uh, the timeline was different uh, than that the jam was sent to work along National Road Number 6. So please uh, make it clear in your question rather than to uh, confuse the uh, witness due to the unclear nature of your question. You may refresh it, counsel. Um, I'm not sure, Mr. President, but the, the first January dam worksite we have been discussing at length was in 77, um, same period of time that we're discussing in relation to Wat Otra Kun. Uh, but I'll rephrase my question. Um, um, Mr. Witness, Two, two weeks ago, you, you testified, and I quote it again, all of them died because everyone was sent to work in the dam site, in the work site. So all of these people may have died because of the labor. And they were arrested together with other people. And they all died. Cham people died. Cham people from Saksur, Antang Sor, Angkor Ban villages died. We used to be working together. When, which period of time are you referring to when you gave that testimony? I knew that when I was uh, taken to be killed, that the young people there were also uh, taken to be killed. And I learned of it when I myself was being taken away to be killed. But again, you're, sp you're speaking specifically um, about people sent to work in the dam site. 
So all of these people may have died because of the labor. That's what you said. What did you mean when you said that? That was my personal conclusion because those people who uh, were sent disappeared and only some Christophe uh, returned who was actually uh, the monk chief at the Tasso village because nobody else returned. So I made my personal conclusion that uh, they all died. And that's my personal opinion. Only you saw a return. And maybe uh, Sof knew how many Jam people died, and uh, Sof is still uh, living today. Um, I'm mindful of the time, uh, so I will finish, uh, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you. And the floor is now given to the defense team for Kyiv Paul. You may proceed, Council. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, good uh, morning, Mr. Imam. I am Anta Guisse. I am the international co-counsel of uh, Mr. Kyiv Paul. And in that capacity, I'm going to put a few complimentary questions to you. First, I would like to put a few questions to you about uh, the period of 1975. Uh, you spoke about the Kopal Rebe Rebellion uh, to my colleague. You said that you had heard about it. So do we agree that in 1975, uh, when you heard about that rebellion, you were in Krokchma district? No, I was not in Krochma district. I was in Saitso village in Pim Chikong. And I was digging the earth at the time while I heard people talking about that event, about the rebellion in Krochma. That's the rumor that I heard. And people who was uh, digging the earth uh, with me spoke about it. And those who were digging the earth with you, were they Cham or were they Khmer? It was a mixture of Jam and Khmer people. And we were digging the earth together. And we were uh, under watch by the Khmerus who were standing nearby, and we did not dare look at their faces. During that period, or later on, under democratic Kampuchea, did you meet people who came from Krochma or who were in Krochma uh, when the rebellion happened? No, I don't. I only heard uh, villagers uh, spoke about it uh, throughout the village. And later on, the Jam people were seriously mistreated. And I did not understand uh, why they were being uh, mistreated and that they were accused of being enemy number one. 
I did not know the reasons behind all this. So when I heard about it, I was wondering uh, what, what was the motive uh, behind it. Even at the moment, I still do not understand the motive behind uh, those events. It was their secret, and I am in no way of knowing it. You were interviewed by Isa Osman, who spoke, who asked you questions about your experience. Uh, and during these interviews, did you bring up uh, the Kopal Rebellion? Do you remember having brought up the Kopal Rebellion with him? Yes, I did. He came to interview me, and I spoke uh, briefly about this point. He asked me about uh, the event uh, that uh, happened in Kopal, and I told him, as I just stated, I heard other people talking about what happened in uh, Kopal and that uh, the Cham people there were so stubborn. And uh, one day, a Cham person who was considered an uh, imam was arrested uh, by the Khmer Rouge. And then he used the imam to speak on the uh, loudspeaker to instruct uh, the, all the charm living in the area, that is, in the uh, Kapol area, to uh, surrender, and that they should not resist uh, the Khmer rules. And that was... Uh, the reason behind the Jam's defeat. And later on, I heard people say that uh, Koh Paul later on uh, was uh, known or was nicknamed Koh Pe, that is uh, literally means the island of ashes, that is after the defeat of the uh, Khmer Rouge, who were accused of accused of being enemy uh, number one by the Khmer Rouge. And I still don't understand the clear uh, motive uh, of uh, the events that took place at Kopal, or what was the reason for the Cham's uh, rebellion. You spoke about Kopal. Aside from Kopal, do you know if there were rebellions elsewhere in Krochma district? Did you hear of any other rebellions in other places as you heard about Kopal? I only heard about uh, Kapol and not about any other rebellions, uh, rebellions elsewhere. And uh, the situation in my village uh, became even worse uh, after we heard about what happened there. And as I stated, I only heard about all these uh, events uh, while I was digging the earth. And I was even uh, fearful of uh, losing my life uh, during the regime. Now I would like uh, to speak about another period, the period uh, during which uh, the Cham were arrested in Saxo. You said that you don't remember exactly when 
the jam were scattered, according to what you said, but you said that you do remember the period when you had to flee and hide in the pond, which you were describing this morning. So my question is, do you remember the year when you hid in the pond? Recall that uh, it happened uh, during the last year of uh, the regime. And uh, that uh, could mean it was in late 1978 or early 79. This is my uh, estimate only, because when I was hiding uh, in the pond. It happened during the final G of the regime, so it could be in late 1978. Because upon my return, uh, the regime fell. Can you confirm that in 1978, the Cham and the Khmer were dressed in the same way. That the Cham were no longer wearing their traditional clothes back then. Before the regime fell, we could not uh, wear any charm traditional dress. We had to wear the same dress as that of the Khmer people, and we also have to cut our hair in the same way as uh, the hair of the Khmer people. We were not allowed to pray, and we were forced uh, to eat pork. We were not allowed to pray or to worship uh, anymore. And if somebody tries to do it secretly and was caught, then the person uh, disappeared. Do you remember if when you were arrested, all the Cham who were arrested as well were dressed as Khmer. Yes, everyone. Everyone had their hair uh, cut short in the same style as that of the Khmer people. At the time, they said that uh, there had to be only uh, one nation in uh, Campuchia. And when we were taken away in drove to be uh, killed, uh, we had our short hair and we were not allowed to uh, have any headscarf. You say they said that we were all Khmer and that we belonged to a same nation. Can you tell us who said that and when you heard that? I cannot tell you if uh, this person A or person B used that term. However, I heard it uh, being said while I was uh, working at the work site.
So while we were uh, working, I heard people uh, speaking about it. And that uh, from day to day, the situation became worse. And the Chan people did not dare to wear uh, headscarf, for instance. We did not dare to pray. And some people did uh, secretly pray at night time. However, they had to be careful and not allow the, the Khmer rules uh, to uh, see it. When you were arrested, uh, can you tell me who was your direct um, superior, your chief? I cannot recall as who was my direct superior when I was arrested and taken away. I was uh, being reassigned uh, from one place uh, to another during the later part of the regime. Uh, my direct superior was also a charm person. I refer to uh, my group chief, but I cannot recall his name. And the people who came to uh, arrest me uh, were the Khmer rules, and I did not know from which level uh, they came. I was only fearful of uh, uh, losing my life after I was uh, arrested. In your Your, in the uh, information document uh, relative to your civil party application, English ERN uh, 00, zero four one seven eight six five uh, Khmer zero zero three six uh, nine zero five three, and there is no French ERN. You say. And this was, you speak about the period just before the end of the regime. And you said that an order had come down from uh, the higher echelon. And who are you speaking about when you speak about higher echelon? And who gave you this information, if you know it, if you know where this information came from? We were living in the uh, village, uh, and while we attended the meeting, we heard about instructions be, uh, being come from the upper echelon, or from uh, Anka at the upper level, but we were never sure as uh, which level it came. But we heard about it all the time, about the upper level or upper echelon. Me. But if I understood you well, no one explained to you who was in question, and you never heard any names uh, uh, relating to what Ankar actually meant. Uh, this was just a generic term that was used, is if, I, if I understood your answer well. Huh? That is correct. I uh, do not uh, know any names of those people at the upper level, although I only heard about uh, instructions or Ankar at the uh, at the upper level, upper echelon, but I uh, do not hear about their names. Uh, Mr. President, uh, 
I am aware uh, of the time. And if the civil party wishes to make his statement, I probably should stop uh, right now with my cross-examination. President, uh, thank you. Mr. Himan, you are given an opportunity to make a statement of harm and suffering regarding the crimes alleged against the two of you, Snuji and Kiu Sumpond, that happened during the Democratic Cambodia, resulting in your civil party application to claim collective and moral reparations for physical, material, or mental injuries as direct consequences of uh, those crimes, if you uh, wish to do so. Civil Party. At uh, present, I am still suffering from what happened uh, during the regime. I lost all my hope since I lost many blood uh, relatives and distant relatives, as well as the property, although I don't want to talk about uh, the property, I have lost uh, all of my relatives. And sometimes I think it is better for me to die rather uh, than to live. Sometimes I think that I uh, become psychotic. People may think that sometimes I am crazy. Although it was uh, fortunate that uh, the Serbians came to rescue us, otherwise we would have died. Everyone, including the Khmer people, would have died without the intervention by the Serbians. I do not know what are the uh, descriptive statements that I can make before your honor, since I myself is uh, illiterate. I cannot provide you any uh, detailed statement. Besides the fact that uh, I do not have any hope in my life. At the moment, I don't have any hope for my future. This is the result of uh, the, the suffering that I received uh, during the regime. As I said, all of my relatives, uh, distant or blood, uh, all died uh, under the regime. And I do not have anything else to add uh, to that uh, statement. And I hope everybody uh, knows what happened. President. Thank you, uh, Mr. Himan, and the hearing of your uh, testimony as a civil party is now concluded.
and the chamber is grateful of your time and testimony and that uh, it may contribute to ascertaining the truth in this case. And you are no longer required uh, to be present in the courtroom and uh, therefore you may return to your residence or wherever you wish uh, to go you wish uh, to go to. The chamber wishes you all the best. Court officer, please make a necessary arrangement to transport Mr. Herman back to his residence or wherever he wishes to go to. This afternoon, the chamber will hear testimony of another civil party, that is 2CCP 270. It is now time for our uh, lunch break. We will take uh, a lunch break now and resume at uh, 1.30 this afternoon. Security personnel, you are instructed to take Kirsten Pond to the waiting room downstairs and have him returned to attend the proceedings this afternoon before 1.30. The court is now in recess. <laughs>